Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Father, I thank you for the amazing, incredible privilege of being able to open the Word of God and that you've given us the teacher, the great revelator of the church, the Holy Spirit. Gracious Spirit of God, Apart from you, we can do nothing. So we ask that you would teach us, that you'd open the eyes of our understanding. Almighty Father, I ask that you would use me tonight. In my weaknesses, your grace is made perfect. And I thank you, Father, for a clarity of thought. I thank you for doing what the Holy Spirit wants done tonight. And most of all, Father, we just want to thank you for Jesus. Living, he loved us. Dying, he saved us. Buried, he carried our sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. And oh, Lord God Almighty, we know that he is coming. And we as the church await his coming. And we say, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. One day he's coming, oh, glorious day. So, Father, until that day, equip us and anoint us and strengthen us with might that we may be the people you need us to be in this hour. And we thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of tonight's message is A Tale of Two Kings. And we're going to be going into the Word of God in 1 Samuel. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel. Or if you've got your electronic Bibles, whatever it is that you're using. I personally think it's great to be able to bring a Bible, the written Word. It doesn't take electricity or batteries. It's there all the time. And you can actually mark it up. And there's something about hearing the word that's so good. Faith comes when the will of God is known. And we know that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But there's something about not just hearing it, but seeing it. When you see it written, when you see that God's written it down for us, there is revelation and there is life in the word of God. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. So we're not just opening any book tonight. We're opening up the book of life, the word of God, the truth of God. Jesus said that, Truth is God's word in John 17, 16. And so I just praise God that you and I in the 21st century have the privilege of being able to open this book and to look into the, to the teachings that the Holy Spirit wants to give the church. We just had a missions conference here and it was about three weeks ago. This is our last missions week and there was 140 delegates from all over the world for the ISOM conference, the International School of Ministry. And honestly, that missions conference rocked me to my very soul. I told Jim I'm not even sure I'm saved after I'd heard the stories about the Chinese church, the Mongolian church, and, and the incredible incendiary firestorm of evangelism and power that God is breathing all over the earth. Over 90% of the body of Christ is not in the United States, it's outside the United States. And so it was so faith producing for me personally. We had some incredible people here, Reinhard Bonnke and the heavenly man, Brother Yen, and it was life changing. And I think since that missions conference, I've just grown even more grateful for the word of God because you and I have it. We're not going to prison because we have a Bible. We have it every day in every translation that we want. And yet there are people all over the earth today that would desire to have what we have. And so I don't want to abuse the privilege of what God's given us. So I'm asking you to pay attention tonight. I'm asking you to listen to what God wants to say to us tonight. And in this message, A Tale of Two Kings, Light or Darkness, We Choose, I want to speak to you tonight about two paths and two directions that we can go. In every culture, in every world system, there are stories of the great fight between good and evil, light and darkness. Christianity, the Muslims, the Hindus, every world religion, every culture has stories of good and evil. And there is no doubt that there is light and there is darkness. But when Jesus came forth, born of a virgin, in the fullness of time, God brought forth his son and he brought forth the redemption and he brought forth the way back to him that we could actually be once again born of the spirit of God. And there's an old saying, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. And so when you and I became born again, our second birth, the first was by the will of man, the flesh, but the second was by the will of the Spirit of God. When you said yes to Jesus Christ, when I said yes to Jesus, when I gave him my life, when I surrendered my life to him, the big mess that it was over 40 years ago, God took me out of darkness and he brought me into the kingdom of his dear son. He took me out of darkness and he brought me into light. 
What I couldn't understand, what didn't make sense to me now, suddenly was becoming clear. And he took me on a path, and it was a narrow road. It wasn't a wide road. It was a narrow road. It's a road of holiness, and it's the road of discipleship, and it's the road that God has carved out for you and I to walk. And on this road, there's a lot of twists and turns, but it's a road of light. And the other road is wide, and many people are on it, Jesus taught us. And there is good and evil, and the road of evil is wide, and it looks good, and it looks inviting, and it looks like it's the way we really should go. But it'll bring us death and destruction. And these two men are great examples of this. We're going to talk about the supernatural tonight. We're going to talk about witches, and we're going to talk about the dark side and the light side. But before we do, let me get to the two kings. And we're going to be speaking about David, and we're going to be speaking about Saul. And in 1 Samuel, it is the story, and it is the journey of Samuel, who was the last judge and prophet of Israel, before Israel decided and demanded that they have an earthly king. Before that, it was a theocracy. Before that, God was the king over Israel. But now Israel is discontent, and they want a king, and they cry out to God, and they say, we want a king. And so God gives them a king. The first king, his name was Saul. Saul was a tall and a handsome man. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Saul stood a head taller than everybody else. Saul was a young man, and he was anointed king of Israel. And he had promise, and he had hope. But Saul took some wrong turns, and he made some wrong directions, and he ends his life in destitution and destruction. And God knew that Saul wasn't going to make it, and so Saul failed, and he raised up another king. And this time, this king was just a young man, and this king didn't look like much. He was handsome, but he wasn't as big as Saul. This king was just a little shepherd boy, and this king, nobody knew, and this king wasn't famous. This king had nothing going for him except for one thing, and that is he loved God with all of his heart. His name was David. So 1 Samuel is the journey of King Saul and King David and the end of King Saul. And I want to look at tonight these two men and these two kings because one made the right choice and one made the wrong choice. One consulted a witch and a medium and the other consulted God. One ended up his life in destruction and death and there was destruction and death for his family and for Israel and one made the choice to serve God and make the right choices and walk the path of righteousness and his kingdom endures forever and God used David to bring forth the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. The messianic king Jesus himself came from the lineage of David. So I'm here to tell you tonight that there is destiny in the choices that you and I make. That there's a legacy that God wants us to leave because this life is a vapor and it's a temporary assignment. When I was with Ellen, this last, the last day of her death, when I was with her, and I was with her right after she died, and I had the privilege of just dressing her before they came to get her, I realized that Ellen had left the building. She was no longer in her body. That it was just a tent, and it was a worn-out tent, and it was going back to the dust. But the Ellen Cobre is alive forevermore, and she lives, and she breathes the breath of heaven, and she's left a legacy of godliness to our family. What are you going to leave when you close your eyes and breathe your last? Because every one of us is going to face death. Every one of us. And Saul faced it one way, and David faced it another. So let me just give you a brief, quick history of David, and then we'll go to Saul. David is Israel's hero. In 1 Samuel, he's killed Goliath. He was just a young teenager, maybe 18, 19. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how old he was. But we knew that he did an incredible miracle, and he killed this great, huge giant, Goliath of Gath. He becomes a hero in Israel. Saul brings him into his court, gives him his daughter, and then Saul begins to get jealous, and David has to run from Saul, and he runs for years. Saul is after him with his armies trying to destroy him, trying to kill him. And David in the meantime is running and hiding. David is walking in integrity. He will not touch God's anointed. He will not go and try to destroy Saul. He does what God tells him to do. But finally, after an incident, David gets weary. Have you ever gotten weary in well-doing? Have you ever done the right thing and bad things just keep happening to you? Well, David gets weary, and David finally says in 1 Samuel 27, and I'm just going to read you two verses. He says, in his heart, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me. 
to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. And David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. So David finally gets tired and he says, I'm done, I'm finished. And he goes over and he lands in the very city of the giant that he killed. And he befriends the lord of that city, Achish. And Achish begins to put David under his wing and David begins to find refuge in the very heart of the enemy's camp. Because David is discouraged and David is tired of running. So David finds himself over on the Philistine side. Now the Philistines are warring against Israel. They are Israel's enemy. So Achish gives him a village and he makes him a, an underlord and he sends David to a place called Ziklag. And there in that village, David is the lord over that village. His 600 men, all of their equipment, all of their goods, all of their sheep, all of the plunder that they have, they have all of their family, their children, their wives. So it's a pretty big crowd that's gone to Ziklag. And, and David and his men do something. They begin to raid the Philistine camps and they begin to raid the, em the enemies, the tribes that were left in the land of Israel that Joshua and the children of Israel did not destroy. The Amalekites and the Hittites. And David begins to take his men, his 600 men, men of war, and they begin to destroy these villages. And he leaves nobody alive. He kills man, woman, and child, and animals so that no one can go back to Achish and say that David is plundering our lands. Because Achish thinks that David is actually going over into Israel and destroying Israel. And Achish thinks that he's got this boy, this young man, this strong warrior. He thinks he's got him in the palm of his hand and that he's loyal to him and that this is an amazing alliance. And he says that David is as an angel of the Lord to him. But David is lying and David is plundering and David is murdering and David is in a very bad place he settles in Ziklag and in 1st Samuel 27 10 let me just read it to you the Nakish would say where have you made a raid today and David would say against the southern area of Judah or against the southern area of the Jeremites or against the southern arena of the Kenites those were all his distant relatives David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us, saying, thus David did. And this was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, he has made his people Israel utterly hate him. Therefore, he'll be my servant forever. So there comes a day when it's time to go to war against Israel. And all the lords of the Philistines, the five lords of the great cities of the Philistine Empire, they come together and there they are going before. And thousands upon thousands are going before. And the lords of the Philistines look at David and, and they look at Achish and they say, why is David here among us? He belongs to the enemy. And Achish defends him and says, look, he's been slaughtering his own people for a year and a half now. You don't have to worry about him. He's going to fight for us. But they're uncomfortable. They say, oh, I don't think so. I can't trust him. What if he turns on us in the midst of the battle? And instead of being for us and an ally, he becomes an enemy and starts to destroy us. And so they were so uncomfortable that they made Achish send David away. And David is sent back to his home, his village of Ziklag. He's disappointed, but God would not allow David. Now hear what I'm going to say. God would not allow David to get into a battle where he'd have to make a wrong choice. I don't know if he would have fought for Israel or if he would have fought for the Philistines. Personally, this is my opinion. I believe since he was already raiding the Philistines and not raiding his own people, he would have fought for his people and turned. But God didn't even give him the chance to make that choice because he sent him back to his city. And when David goes back to his city, he finds that his wife, his children, he finds that his city, Ziklag, it's completely destroyed. It is burnt to the ground, and there's nothing left. Now stop right there, and we're going to go over to Saul. Now this is all happening at the same time. Here's King Saul. Now Saul was the first king. He was the king that everybody had their hopes in. But Saul had disobeyed early on in his kingdom, and he had not done what God had asked him to do, and God had asked him to destroy an Amalekite king, and he hadn't. Therefore, because of Saul's disobedience, God took the kingdom from him. And Samuel, who was the prophet and the last judge of Israel at that time, who anointed David and he anointed King Saul, Samuel was the judge. He was the man to be. This prophet, 
said to Saul that because you have not obeyed the Lord, he has ripped the kingdom from your hand. And therefore, Saul was jealous when David came up and there was this incredible feud between the two of them and Saul wanted to destroy David because God had already told Saul, it's too late for you, your kingdom is destroyed. But you see, Saul didn't repent. Saul had a choice to go on the narrow road and repent and do right. Or he had a choice to keep going in the dark way and Saul chose to go the dark way. So Saul now, 40 years later, we know that Saul was king for about 40 years. Because in Acts chapter 13, verse 21, it says that Saul was king of Israel over 40 years. So he's not a young man. He's an old man now. And now the Philistines, remember I just said that the Philistines are about to go to war with Israel? There's a big valley and the Philistines are on one side and Saul and his armies are on the other. So there's a great war that is about to take place and Saul's afraid. He's tried to contact God and he can't hear from God. God's not speaking to him. That might be because Saul had destroyed the city of Nam, which was the city of the priests. He'd killed 85 priests, and then he set to fire and killed everyone in the city of the priests, Nob. Every man, woman, and child, he destroyed everything in that city. He destroyed any means of communication with God. Saul is getting worse and more crazy and more crazy as he ages and his kingdom goes on. So Saul is afraid, and he can't hear from God. He doesn't know what to do, so we pick up the story in chapter 28. And it says in verse 1 that it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, you will certainly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. And David says to Achish, surely you know that your ser what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore, I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. But we have already know that he, he was sent away. But here's what Saul does. Now, same time, it's all happening at the same time. Verse 3, now Samuel had died and all Israel lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put out all the mediums and the spiritualists out of the land. Now God tells us in Deuteronomy that they are not to allow mediums and wizards, necromancers, those that channel, those that speak with the dead, witches, warlocks. None of those were to remain alive in the land of Israel. They were an abomination to God. And so Saul had done that. He had thrown them all out of Israel. Verse 5, then the Philistines gathered together and encamped at Shuan. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. I'm sorry, I was in verse 4. If you've got your Bibles, follow me. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. So now he sees this incredible army in front of him and he doesn't know what to do. He hasn't been able to connect with God. He's tried to do the right thing, but it's too late. Too little, too late. So he's afraid. So what does Saul do in verse 6? And Saul inquired of the Lord. The Lord did not answer him. Either by dreams or by the Urim or by the prophets. Then Saul says to his servants, find me a woman who is a medium. That I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium of Endor. So Saul disguises himself and he puts on other clothes and he comes with two men and he goes to this witch's house and he inquires of her and he tells her that he wants her to bring a seance together for him. And then he says in verse 9, then the woman said to him, look, you know that Saul is done. Now he's cut off the mediums and the spiritualists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And this is what Saul says this in verse 10. And Saul swore to her by the Lord. He's the king of Israel. Now he's bringing God's name into something that God told him never to do. He swears to her by the Lord. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. God's already told them that we're not to suffer those ones who do these abominations to live. They were under the law. And now Saul completely commits blasphemy by swearing in God's name that she will live. So, she begins to do her thing. And the woman said, who shall I bring up for you? And he says, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, verse 12, she cries, out, she cries with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. Something happens that she wasn't expecting. And she is afraid. And she says, why have you deceived me? And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? So obviously she could see something he couldn't. And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. 
So we said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up. He's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. He stooped with his face to the ground. He bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul in verse 15. So here's the scene. He has already committed blasphemy. He's already afraid. He's already destroyed. And he goes to a medium to find out what God's going to do. And he calls up Samuel. She calls up Samuel. She's terrified. And Saul is paralyzed with fear. And up comes Samuel. Now, there's two schools of thought here. Some say that it was a spirit. It was a familiar spirit. And part of the church says that it was Samuel. I'm going to give you my impression. It's my impression. You are free to make your own choice. Is that all right? I personally believe it was Samuel. And I believe it was Samuel because the Bible says it was Samuel and that Samuel spoke the word of the Lord and he prophesied about something that hadn't happened yet and it happened. And God is certainly able to cause his people to speak. On the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke chapter 16, there was Moses and Elijah with Jesus and they spoke and Peter heard them. Are you with me? Now this is before the cross. He's coming up out of. So in my opinion, it's Samuel, but it's not important whether it was or it wasn't. What is important is what Saul did and what God did and what David did. And that's where I want to go. Is that all right? But mediums and wizards and necromancers, channelers, these are all very real. These are things God says are an abomination to him. And that we're not to touch them or we're not to get near them because they represent the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness is ruled by Satan. And it's a kingdom of deception. It's a kingdom of lies. It's a kingdom of false power. But it nevertheless is his kingdom. And it is real. Now, we're not to be afraid of it. We're not to be superstitious over it. But we are not to go there to find light because there is no light in that kingdom. Now, she calls up Samuel, or the spirit, and Samuel, in verse 15, says to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answers, I'm deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? The Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalekite. Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. And Saul hears this. He is so afraid. He's paralyzed with fear. The witch is absolutely stupefied. She, doesn't, she can't even believe that this is happening. And Paul, Saul, excuse me, Saul is absolutely on his face and he'll eat nothing. He's, he's trembling because of what Samuel has said. So... This medium comes to him and says, look, you've got a battle tomorrow. You've got to eat something. And she kills a calf and she makes him bread. So here Saul is, the king of Israel, God's anointed, God's king that was to hear and judge his people according to the law of God. Here's this first king that has completely gone and left the path of righteousness and left the narrow road of holiness and serving God and doing what God has told him to do. And he's lost everything and now he's on his last night. And a witch is giving him his last meal. Now let's fast forward and let's now go to David. Now David, same battle. It's all happening at the same time. Two kings. Are you with me? David has gone to Ziklag and he's found that everything's burned and that his family's gone. The women, the children, everything's gone. Everything's gone. He has 600 men with him. And they are so distressed and they are so angry and so hurt that they want to kill David. And this is what happened. So Saul's on his face and David's men want to kill him. Two kings, same time, two experiences. So David is there and in chapter 29... 
It says, I'm sorry, chapter 30, it says in verse 6 that David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So David seeks God. God gives him his advice. God tells him what to do. He says, go and recover all. David and his men take off. They recover everything and they have a great victory. David lives, Saul dies. David's progeny is blessed with legacy and the eternal kingship of Messiah, Lord himself, because David obeyed God. Saul, his lineage is gone. He's no longer king. And all that God had planned for his life is over, simply because they made choices. One made the choice for darkness, and one made the choice for light. And Rock Church, it's the same in our lives every day. We have to make choices. We can choose darkness, or we can choose light. We can choose a wide, easy way to go that everybody's traveling on, or we can choose a narrow way that God says is the way for us to go. One is wide and easy, one is narrow and difficult. And I want to look at these two men now, and just four little things from their lives, and then we're going to talk about Halloween. Is that all right? So, things to learn from this, this little story is, number one, Saul's an example to me and David's an example to me. Obviously, Saul's an example of what not to do. Would you say so? Saul ended in destruction. He fell on his sword. He committed suicide. His sons all died on Gilboa. It was a tremendously sad, incredible defeat. Israel wept. The army was defeated. And when David heard it, he tore his clothes and he mourned because Jonathan and all of Saul's sons were killed that were on that battlefield with Saul. Not all the sons were killed, but all the sons on the battlefield were killed, just what God said. So if I'm gonna learn something from what not to do, I'm gonna learn number one from Saul that I cannot make friends with the darkness. Because there is light and there is darkness. It says that, in, let's just go back to 1 Samuel chapter 28. Let's just look there again in chapter 28. Let's look at verse 15. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? God has departed from me, and he doesn't answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by name. And so Samuel says, why did you bring me up? And Saul says, well, because God's not talking to me. So when God's not talking, where do we go to hear? Samuel went to darkness. He went to a witch. He went to a medium. It's real. When things aren't going your way, and when life is hard, and when things aren't happening, when there's a battle before you, and the enemy is right on your doorstep, the enemy wants to do everything he can to put such pressure on you, such pressure on me that we will go into the darkness and will not stay in the light and stand in the light where there is true help. Saul went to the darkness and he failed. Now what does God say about doing that? He says, make no friends. Have no alliances with the unfruitful words of darkness. Don't do that. Don't even go there. Ephesians 5.11 says in the New Living Translation, take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness and said, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. Whether this was really Samuel or whether this was a familiar spirit really doesn't matter. The point is, is that Saul sought guidance and a word from God through a witch. And when a Christian is under pressure and doesn't know what to do, there is such a temptation to take that extra drink, to start smoking that joint, to watch what you shouldn't be watching, to talk to people that are ungodly and don't have an idea about what dark and light is. There's a temptation, and there will be pressure for you to go where you have already been rescued from. And if we go back to those places, we will be destroyed and we will not see the victory that God had already intended for us. Because God's got a victory in the midst of a battle that looks impossible. And Satan wants to push us back into the darkness, back into his playground where he is Lord, little L. And when you find yourself tempted to do the things that you have been rescued out of, God says that's the time to run and run to the light and don't run into the darkness because the darkness is going to entrap and destroy you and ruin what God has already ordained as victory for you and your family because there is a miracle on the other side of your obedience but there is death and destruction on the side on the other side of my disobedience and my rebellion number two don't make friends with the darkness 
Seek God first. When the you-know-what hits the fan, when the trouble comes, when the battle is raging, when the doctor's report comes in, when the finances are absolute, there's no hope. When those kids have gone south on you, when that marriage, there's no hope of rescue for that marriage. When you are on your last nerve and you are on your last moment of faith, God says, don't run from me, run to me. Because when David went to Ziklag and he found out that his woman, his wives, his children, and all the men, the mighty warriors that David had, they all had lost everything. They were so angry. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill David. These were men that had fought with him. These were men that would die for him. They were so distressed that his church, his group, his company of men said, that's it, we're killing you. And what did David do? It says in 1 Samuel, let's just go there. In chapter 30, verse 6, now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David, let me read it to you in the New Living Translation. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and their daughters. They began to talk of stoning him. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Just take a moment and think about Saul. He was so afraid. The witch was terrified. Saul was paralyzed with fear on his face as Samuel's talking. There is on that scenario, in that home, at that time, absolute fear, hopelessness, and trouble. And here is David over on his side, this other king, and everyone is about ready to kill him. Is he afraid? Is he on his face with fear? It says that David strengthened himself and found strength in the Lord his God. Then he said to Abathar the priest, bring me the ephod. So Abathar brought it, and David asked of the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. Saul sought a witch and died, and his family died. His kingdom was completely taken out of his hands. His wealth, his prosperity, his success was completely lost. And David sought the Lord, and God said, go and recover all. You see, when you seek darkness, that decision has a consequence. When you seek light and you follow after God, God will come through for his people because he's a faithful God. He's got a plan to bless and not to curse. He's got a plan for us to go over and not under. He's got a plan for us, and the very thing that the enemy wants to do to crush us will be the very thing God will use to put us over and to make us grow into a place that we can only go to and not grow to. There are things in our lives that we're never going to learn unless we're in a battle. We're not going to grow up and be the people that we need to be if everything's always comfortable for us. Life is not going to happen that way. It doesn't happen that way. What the enemy means for harm, God turns around for good. But in the good, God teaches and trains his people with overcoming faith and how to be courageous and bold because David first sought God and he didn't seek the enemy. So when you're in a trouble, the first thing, the first thing that we have to do is to seek God, not go to the wine or the booze or the dope. Don't roll a joint and get stoned. For God's sake, don't do that. The Greek word for drugs is pharmakeia. It's what we use. It's actually the Greek word for witchcraft. It's the word we use for drugs, pharmacy. I am an ex-druggie. When I was a young woman, my ex-husband was a drug dealer. I know that marijuana is legal now. And there's pressure to legalize it, but listen. It is a gateway drug. It opens the door to places that God did not mean for us to go in the spirit realm. And when you get joint, when you get a joint and you begin to get stoned and everything seems better and life is better for you, or you pop a pill, all of a sudden the reality that God needs you to face, to hear his voice is now dimmed and you're dulled and you're drugged and you no longer can hear from God like Saul. And you're in the enemy's camp and you're not in God's camp. And for God's sake, for God's sake, for heaven's sake, for future generations' sake, don't let yourself be pressured into that camp. It will destroy you. David 
sought God and God gave him instruction. So what did David do? Number three, you got to do what God says to do. It's not easy. It's going to take courage. It's going to take hard work. Everybody wanted to quit. They wanted to kill David. Saul was so paralyzed, all he could do was lay on the floor before that witch, and she fed him his last meal, for God's sake. Here's David. God says, go and recover all. So now he's got to muster up his men who want to stone him. But you see, my Bible says in Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he'll cause even his enemies to be at peace with him. So when I begin to step into the kingdom of darkness and I begin to take ground and then all of a sudden hell comes at me and I want to be absolutely intimidated back so that I don't fight the fight of faith and the fight that God's called me to fight and everybody's against me, God says if you'll do the right thing the right way and keep doing it, I'll cause even your enemies, those that are not following you, your family that thinks you're crazy, the boss that wants to fire you, the husband that wants to leave you, the children that don't want to get in line. He'll cause even those enemies to be at peace with you. And David's men went with him, and off they go to destroy the Philistines. Now, here's the interesting thing. So I got to, number one, I got to not make friends with the darkness. That's not where to go. Number two, I got to do what God says. And number three, I got to fight to win. David decided to go and do what God said to do. So in... 1 Samuel 30, 17, it says, Then David attacked them from twilight until evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. Look. David had 600 men. They were ready to kill him. Now they're ready to go fight with him. He goes and he does what God says to do. It's not an easy thing. Church, when God says to fight, to stand and fight. When you've done all, stand, therefore. God says, fight to win. Don't fight with the vision of loss and destruction. Fight with the vision of overcoming and winning and recovering everything the enemy wants to steal from you. Because the enemy wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if he can intimidate you, and if he can huff and puff and try to blow your house down, he will. But when you stand up against him and say, oh, hell, you are not going to win this battle. Hell, I say no to you and I say yes to heaven. And you begin to fight the fight of faith and you begin to do what God says to do. God will give you the grace to win that battle because David had 400 men. 200 stayed on one side with the luggage and 400 went with David. Now, this is what it says. And I find this an interesting verse. Verse 17 of 1 Samuel chapter 30. Then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. So in my calculation, twilight until the evening of the next day. Is that more than 24 hours to you? Would you say that? So they're having a battle for a very, very long time. There's no break. There's not a lunch break. There's not a coffee break. There is solid fighting. He's got 400 men. And this is what the word says, not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. So how big was that army? 400 escaped that were the size of David's army. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God told David to go fight a fight that he was far outnumbered in. God told David to go do the impossible. Here's David when his men have had it, they're ready to kill him. Everything's gone. The Amalekites that David had destroyed, you reap what you sow, had now come back to destroy him. David could have said, you know what, I deserve this. I, I, I killed them, I raided their villages. Now they're just bringing on me what I brought on them. I am reaping what I sowed. But David didn't do that. You see, because God is able to play catch up. Even when we deserve to get what we get, God is the God of mercy. He's the God of grace. He's the God that says, oh no, what the enemy meant for harm, what he wants to take you out with, even though he may tell you you deserve it, I've got something called grace and hope and goodness and mercy. And even though you may deserve it, child, because you belong to me, I'm going to cause you to become what you never could be, do what you never could do, and recapture what is impossible in the natural for you to ever win. Because God is a good God who is faithful and loves his people when they hear him and obey him and do what he says. You know, I think God gets disgusted with us 
when we are fearful, when we're wimps. I think God says, you know what? I need you to have courage. I don't need you to be afraid. Saul was afraid and lost. David had courage and he won. And I wrote a little definite courage out about four years ago and I just want to read it to you because I like this definition. And courage is not the absence of mind-numbing fear. But in the midst of this uncircumcised, irreverent phobia, it is a heroic presence of brave, bold, gut-wrenching, nerve-bending, risky, foolhardy, audacious faith that defies the enemy and looks to heaven for help and victory. God's, I think God is saying, will my children just be audacious? Will they just be absolutely outrageous in their faith for me? And when you and I begin to hear the word of God, faith comes when the will of God is known. Well, God tells you what to do, even though it looks impossible. If you'll run to the battle and do what God tells you to do, he, you will have victory. Saul, he ran to the witch and died. David ran to God, did what God said, and fought to win. And he had a victory that day and became the king over Israel. And his lineage endures forever and ever. There are choices that we have to make. And the choices that we make today will affect the generations that are in our lives in the future. There is a miracle on the other side of your obedience. But there is also death and destruction on the other side of rebellion and disobedience. Two paths, two kings, two ways to go. Now, it's Halloween this week. What should we do? Are there mediums? Are there witches? Is the kingdom of darkness real? Yes, it is real. But God's never told us to be afraid of it. He's never told us to be superstitious about it. He's never told us to back off. He's never told us to be in fear at night because the boogeyman might get us. You see, that's all intimidation and that's all fear from Satan's kingdom. What God's told us to do is fight the good fight of faith. He's told us to seek him, obey him, and fight to win. So, what do you think we ought to do about Halloween? What is Halloween? Because I, I shared this tonight because you've got families. Some of you have children. When Jim and I were young pastors, I was so, so completely a fanatic that I just wouldn't let the kids ever trick or treat. Ever, ever, ever. In our first church, no, it wasn't allowed. We had a little harvest carnival at the church, but they were never going door to door. And then one day, God said, you really don't have to be that way. You don't have to be afraid of the darkness. I don't need you to curse the people. I need you to be the light that shines in their lives. So I tried to take my kids trick-or-treating. I said, kids, mom's been set free. We're going to go trick-or-treating. And so they got all dressed up in costumes. And we went on, on the first door. And my children hated it so much they would not go. I think we went to three houses and that was it. So when we started The Rock, we determined that we would light a candle and be the light that shines and not curse the darkness because there's enough darkness already all around us. Am I afraid of witches? Absolutely not. Are they real? Yeah, but what is that to God? God has overcome every enemy of darkness. The enemy, Satan, is no power for God. In the book of Revelation, he's going to destroy him with one breath of his mouth for crying out loud. He's only alive right now and doing what he's doing because God's on a timetable and has a plan he has even created the destroyer to destroy. He is not up in arms about Satan and Satan's kingdom. He's not upset about it. He's not worried about it. He's not frightened over Satan. He's just simply saying to his people, I've got a better road for you. I've got a better way of life for you. I've got more power than you can ever dream of. And it's not in evil and darkness. It's in the light. So what are we to do? So I thought, just for your information, would you like to just see the origins of Halloween? And then what are we supposed to do? And we'll wrap it all up with that. It's a three-minute video. Is that all right? Would you like to see it? So why don't we show this video and then we'll wrap it up for the night. When most people think of Halloween, they think of trick-or-treating, parades, bobbing for apples, and other family-friendly activities. But bet you didn't know the true story behind the ancient origins of Halloween. It all goes back some 2,000 years to the ancient Celtic festival known as Samhain, celebrated on November 1st. On the night before Samhain, people believed that the dead returned as ghosts. They would leave food and wine on their doorsteps to keep roaming spirits at bay and wear masks when they left the house so they would be mistaken for fellow ghosts. 
The Christian church turned Samhain into All Saints Day, or All Hallows, in the 8th century. The night before became All Hallows Eve, later shortened to Halloween. You've heard of trick-or-treating on Halloween, but what about souling or guising? All three of these traditions originated in medieval Britain. On All Souls Day, November 2nd, the needy would beg for pastries known as soul cakes. In return, they would pray for people's dead relatives. This was called souling. In the medieval Halloween tradition of guising, young people would dress up in costume and accept food, wine, money, and other offerings in exchange for singing, reciting poetry, or telling jokes. In 19th century America, Irish and Scottish immigrants revived these old traditions. The result was trick-or-treating. At first, it was much more about the tricks, in the form of pranks and hijinks, than the treats. It wasn't until the 1950s that the custom took on its current family-friendly, kid-centered form. Today, Halloween is big business, with U.S. consumers spending more than $2.5 billion on costumes annually. Add in the candy, and it's estimated that Americans spend up to $6 billion on Halloween each year, making it the second most commercial holiday after Christmas. So whether you're a fan of tricks, treats, or trivia, there's a bit of Halloween history. We bet you didn't know! <laughs> I chose this video because it was secular. It was from the History Channel, and we have permission to show it. The reason I chose it was because it doesn't have a Christian intent, it's just pure history. So Halloween began as a demonic day, and the church in the eighth century, the Pope decided to redeem the day and make it All Saints Day. So what does all that mean to us? It means, number one, that at The Rock we believe that no day belongs to Satan, and no evening belongs to Satan. That God is the God of heaven and he's the God of earth. He's the God that created the day and the night. And he is Lord over all. Like we started with this today when I began to speak to you. I talked to you about Rahab. He's God in heaven. He's God in the earth. Listen, witches, mediums, necromancers, drugs, none of this is new. It's all been around since the fall of man. Do we need to fear it? Absolutely not, but let's don't celebrate it. So if we are going to be Christians and redeem the day, then let's light a light and not curse the darkness. The people, if you're gonna stay home, we're having an amazing trunk or treat at The Rock on Friday night for a safe environment for our kids to come and have fun and get some candy. They're gonna dress up. We don't want, we don't want them to dress up as witches or skeletons or anything demonic because that's evil. Why would you wanna put that on your children? If you're reading astrology and if you're reading your horoscope, if you're doing that, stop it. It's darkness. Stop it right now and just repent of it. Ask God to forgive you and God will shine the light into your heart because that kingdom of darkness is real. But we're not to fear it. We're not to be overcome by it. We are to overcome evil with good. So let's do that on Friday night. If you've got children, bring them here. If you don't have children, come and volunteer and help us. If you don't want to come, then stay home. But open the door and shine the light and buy the best candy you can buy and give the best candy bars you can give to your neighbors because it might be a great way to meet your neighbors and begin to actually build a relationship with them and they can see that christians aren't these religious crazy superstitious people but we actually are children of god that are not afraid of the darkness and that we know who our God is, and God loves people. So let's love them to life, and let's not judge them to death. Is that all right? So if you're coming, come and volunteer. If you want to have a trunk or treat, if you want to fill your car, your trunk up with candy, we invite you to come and let the children's ministry know. If you want to come and volunteer, we're having some games. We're just going to let our kids play. If you're bringing kids, put them in something holy. What does that mean? Dress them up as something fun or as a Bible character. This is just real quick, I want to mention, there's going to be kids here that are going to be dressed in goblin outfits and skeleton outfits and, you know, monster outfits and all that stuff. Our job is not to criticize them, not to point out the error to the parents, not to make them feel uncomfortable. Look, they just didn't know. And so our job is to get them into the church so they can hear a message like tonight and grow in what's right. But if we start to preach at them during trunk or treat and we start to criticize them 
or we say, oh, why did your mother dress you like that? You look terrible. And then we hurt them. Then what they do is they run off and think we're a bunch of religious idiots. And we never get the opportunity to minister to them. Love wins them over every time. Let's just look past the bones and skeletons and stuff of those who will dress and let's walk in love and let's encourage people to get back to church where they can learn what's right and what's wrong and make the choices to obey God or not to obey God. And that's their choice and their call. Thanks, Deb. I just had to throw that in, okay? Thanks, honey. You know, I... Luke was supposed to preach tonight, and he just had, he was just so sick in his body. I said, I'll, I'll take it. So I don't know if I messed up or if I, all my, all my points weren't right or something. Forgive me. I'm just a nana that, you know, swelling it out there to you. But remember this. There's two roads. One's wide, one's narrow. One's dark, one's light. Saul made a choice, and it affected the generations after him and his family. David made a choice, and it affected the generations forever. All of us are a result of his right choices. There are miracles on the other side of your right choices. There is legacy and blessing because God wants to bless you. He wants to bless your family. And we're going to receive tithes and offerings tonight, but before we do, I want to do this. I want to talk to you for just another moment because I don't know everybody here, and I don't know where you're at. I was just with Ellen on Monday, kissed her on her cheek, and on Tuesday, I kissed her goodbye. Her body was alive on Monday, and her body was dead on Tuesday. It's appointed once for man to die in the judgment. Every one of us, every one of us, going to die. But God says that he's put eternity in our hearts. And even though we grow old, we don't grow old on the inside. We're ageless on the inside because God made us in his image and there's eternity in our heart. You and I are going to live somewhere forever and ever. Earth is a very temporary assignment, but eternity is never ending. So my question is, when you die, when you die, where are you going to spend eternity? Are you going to spend it in heaven with Jesus, with God? with a destiny that he has already arranged for you? Or are you going to make the choice, like Saul, to choose the darkness and spend it in hell? And I know hell's not popular. I was just preaching at a church about three weeks ago, and boy, didn't mention hell. It's told not to mention hell. Hell is, is not something people want to talk about, but yet the Bible talks about hell. And Jesus said that hell is real. It's where the flame is not quenched. It's eternal. God didn't make us for hell. He made hell for Satan and his angels. But God has given us a choice. He's given us a choice. He's given us everlasting life through his son, Jesus Christ. He says, choose life. Or we can choose death like Saul and we can choose the darkness. What have, what have you chosen? Where are you at? And maybe you say, well, I'm not sure where I'm at. I, I think I'm going to heaven. But you know why? Why do you think that? Because we're Americans and we're taught that all roads lead to heaven. God never said all roads lead to heaven. He says there's one road. It's narrow and it's the only way and it's his way. It's God's heaven. What makes me think I can get to God's heaven my way? God said that he made a provision for us to get to heaven, but it's his way. And it's by sending his only begotten son, Jesus, who died for us, died for my sins and died for your sins. He was the last Adam. He represented the human race on that cross and where you couldn't ever pay back everything that you've ever done any more than I could. I can't go back and undo all the horrible things I did before I met Jesus. But when I looked to that cross and I said, I believe in Jesus. He is who he says he is. He is the son of God. He did die for me. God did raise him from the dead. He is God. When I did that and I surrendered my heart and my life to him, something happened in my life and I didn't make it happen. I just received the gift of salvation and said yes to the truth of what Jesus did for me. We sang it today. We sang it tonight. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, a glorious day. He died, he raised from the dead, and he's coming again. And for all those that believe in him and surrender their heart and their life to him. You see, it's not just, oh yeah, I'm going to pray this little prayer. And all of a sudden, I'm going to be this little Christian. But I'm going to go live the way I want to. You see, that's not salvation. 
That's foolishness. Salvation is when you and I believe in our hearts and we start to live it out in our lives. As a new Christian, I didn't know what I was doing. I was still living with a man. God had to clean me up little by little from the inside out. But he did as I just kept coming. I kept doing what God asked me to do. I'd fall and then I'd make mistakes and then I'd get back up and God just kept loving me, loving me to life, loving me to life until I'm here today. So you may not know. Gee, I don't know, I'm not sure, but I can tell you this. In your heart of hearts, if you were to die tonight, if you've said yes to Jesus Christ, and if you've let him be your Savior and your Lord, how? By surrendering your life to him and believing that he is who he says he is, then you're born of the Spirit of God. And you're on your way to heaven, doing your best to serve him. But if you have never surrendered your heart and your life, maybe you've been good, maybe you go to church, maybe you're better than I'll ever dream of being, but goodness is not going to get you to heaven. Acts and works are not going to get you to heaven. It's a believing heart with a corresponding life that surrenders to God and keeps following him. If you've never surrendered your heart and your life, then tonight God brought you here so that you could have the opportunity to start life all over and be born again. So all over this auditorium, I'm just gonna ask you, we'll do it all at the same time. If you're, not, if you're not born again, if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, I'm gonna give you an opportunity. If you've said, well, I, I served God, but I left, I backslid, then you need to get right with God. Saul never repented, you see. He never changed his heart. But God says, repent and turn and be saved. It's time for you, and you're here tonight, to do and be what God's called you to be. He's already done it all, but you have to receive the gift. You have to say yes to Jesus and surrender your life to him. So I'm just going to ask all over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm going to ask you, it's time to get right. If you've been a good person but never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, I'm going to ask you, it's time tonight. If you're a rascal like I was and a backslider and you know you need to repent and get right with God, then I'm going to, going to tell you tonight's your night. So I'm just going to count to three. I'm going to clap like this. My husband's got big hands. It makes a lot of noise. My hands are little. And they're old and they don't make a lot of noise anymore. But I'm just going to clap my hands. And if you're ready to get right with God, I just want you to lift your hand like this and I'll see it all over this auditorium. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. I see that hand. Lift them high so I can see them. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Lift them high. I see that hand. I see that hand. Family room over here. Anybody need to get right with God tonight? Anybody over in this section? I think I saw about six or seven hands. This is what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to stand. We're still going to take tithes and offerings. We're not done with the service, but I just want to get you saved right now. Let's, let's, let's do that right now, and then we'll continue the service, and we're almost finished. Will you just give me five more minutes? If you raised your hand or you didn't and you should have, I just want you to stand. Come quickly to the front. Just come quickly to the front. Let's just get right with God now. Just get right now. Let's just let God change you. You can't change you, but he can change you. In you. He's not mad at you. He loves you. Jesus, He's not in shock over your life. He wants to get your life right, but you got to come. He's already saved. He's already done. Now you have to say yes. He's a gentleman. He will not force his way into your life. But he will come when you ask him to come. And he will save you to the uttermost and change you forever. Jesus, I they're coming just quick coming just quickly come quickly come anybody else need to get right with God anybody else quickly come quickly come oh I remember I didn't know what I was doing but oh when I said yes to Jesus everything in my life changed from the inside out what was impossible for me was now possible with God Jesus I believe Aren't you lovely? Look at you beautiful young people. My goodness. This is Pastor Joel. We're going to just travel with you off to a little room. It's called uh, the living room. And we're going to talk to you and pray with you, okay? You can come right back in. We're almost finished with the service. It means you're going to miss the offering tonight. That's okay. Just make a right turn or a left turn, whatever that direction is. And just follow. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer. 
of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.